Welcome to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton. And welcome to another exclusive Toffee Blues interview, where today it's a real pleasure for me to be joined by former Everton striker Marcus Bent. Welcome to the Toffee Blues, Marcus. How are you, mate? I'm good, fella. You? I'm fantastic, mate. I've been staying safe here. Obviously, it's a strange time. We're just staying all we're all staying in me and the family. Of course, you're you're living in London yourself, aren't you? With your family, are you staying safe and staying at home? Yep, definitely. Um, we've just had a little baby girl. I mean, I've got an um, an older one that's um, fourteen, um, uh, but just had a little one. She's now fourteen weeks. Uh, we've got two dogs, um, so just trying to keep healthy, um, get out um, when I can, walk the dogs, have a run, um, and uh, I've been doing a couple of zooms. Um, I mean, it's a new thing, zooms. Um, but um, do it with, um, you know, Evertonians and uh, previous clubs that I've been at. So it's good to talk. It's good to get out there and it's good to um, feel better about yourself, I suppose. Yeah, of course. Like, of course, getting in touch with all the former players and stuff, it's been really enjoyable to sort, and it really gives you the lift in these sorts of strange times as well, like you say. So you say you've had a, f- a few other clubs, a few of your other former clubs. You've been on with them as well? Well, I've, 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 I've spoke to a couple of uh, coaches and stuff in America, um, uh, former uh, coaches and uh, teammates and stuff. Uh, I spoke to Ipswich. I spoke to a couple of Everton TV um, uh, uh, podcasts as well. Um, so it's just not, it, rather than just, don't get me wrong, it's good to be inside with your family and, your, and, and, and speak and watch Netflix and as as you probably do, but well, certainly it's yeah. nice to get out there and communicate and speak to other people, you know, uh, uh, as these times are going on and um, it's hard to see your friends and family. It's great to, like, like you say, to reconnect with all your former players and former coaches, like you say, so... It, obviously, we're going to actually start on that note by looking back on your earlier career. You you had already tasted Premier League football before you came to Everton with a number of yeah. clubs, Crystal Palace, Ipswich, as you say, and Leicester. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you played relatively well with those teams, but I think you suffered relegation from the Premier League with all of them, didn't you? I, I suffered relegation with, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, going to Blackburn, we got um, we got into the Premiership, but I got sold to Ipswich and done really well there. Um, but uh, administration and stuff uh, uh, got brought into the, well, not brought into the club. It happened because of certain situations. Um, uh, so, I got uh, loaned out to Leicester, um, who were in the Premiership, playing alongside the likes of Frank Sinclair, um, Muzzy is it? Um, Les Ferdinand. I mean, I could go on. Um, uh, who in the Premiership was a really good. Uh, Mickey Adams was the manager. Um, so once I went there, I kind of um, hit the floor running. Really, um, I remember um, having. Well, sorry, had my um, eldest um, towards the end of the season, and uh, we played Everton. And um, scoring in the last, goals, yeah, yeah. scoring in the last, well, yeah. I don't know whether it was the last minute or, but it was, it was, it was near to it. Um, Joe Yobo on the back post, and um, I, I headed it in, and then uh, celebrated by, um, uh, as they do or as we do, um, by kind of um, celebrating my baby. Um, oh, brilliant! Yeah, um, and then uh, going into the off season. Um, Everton came in and um, wanted to take me. So um, I jumped at the chance and that was the season that uh, Wayne Rooney was going to Manchester United with his metatarsal um, being broken. Um, So it was a big, um, uh, I suppose uh, it was, it was, it was, it was hard. It was, it was a big thing for me that I had to go in and replace Wayne. Uh, We call him Dog. Um, up and coming, the next man to be England captain, and um, so I had to step up, and um, I took it upon myself to um, step up and, and 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 do what I could. So obviously, like you say, you ended up leaving Leicester to go to Everton uh, in the summer of two thousand and four. How did the move come about? Did like Everton get in touch with you? Your representative? Yeah, well, yeah, probably, yeah, my agent and stuff. Um, I, I don't know what holiday I was on at that time. I mean, I've been on 
so many holidays I can't even remember but um yeah uh, my agent called me and said Everton were um, in for me and David Moyes wants to speak to me and I spoke to David and he um enticed me to come down and um I never looked back to be honest I, there were other clubs coming in for me um but um Everton were the one they were the ones I wanted to go to big club Duncan Ferguson um you know the rest of them uh Lee Carsley um Tommy Gravison I mean that's just the pool in itself um I didn't really know much too much about Everton but um, I knew that they were a big club and I, I wanted to go and um, better myself and play with the likes of those international players and quality players. I mean, looking back at the season before um, uh, I joined, it, it nearly got relegated. So there was a big um, expectation on us to stay up and do well in the Premiership. So there were um, pluses, there were minuses, but... Um, when I came into the club, it, it was a positive club. It was a big club. It was a um, a fresh season, and um, and we brought Timmy in, Timmy Cahill. Yeah, yeah. Timmy came in just after me. I think he came in a week after me, um, and we didn't know what we were going to do um, in pre-season, but we had a good pre-season. Went to a um, Sorry. Yeah, we went. Um, it wasn't, was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, Houston. sorry. Yeah, yeah, it was. Sorry, we went to Texas, Houston. Yeah, I, I used to room with Tim. Uh, sorry, uh, Jay, uh, uh, Joe Yobo. Um and we all just bonded. We all bonded. McFadden, um, um, the likes of Kevin Kilban, Lee Carsley, um, legends at the club, and they knew where they wanted to go, and they they kind of taught me the life of being a blue in a sense. Um, so I kind of learned it quick and learned how to work hard and wanted to be a part of it. That's great. That's great to hear you say that, but especially about your teammates. You mentioned Joseph Yobo there, who you, you said you were very close with. Uh, it's funny you should mm. see that because we had him on the show a couple of days ago. Oh, you did? No way. We did, okay. we did yeah. And, uh, how is he? Is he okay? Yeah, he's great. He's back in Nigeria with his family and... Mm. Yeah, but yeah, he's staying safe as well. But uh, it's That's great to hear you say you were very close to him because he, he was mm. very fond of the club and he remembers that time very well as well. So, yeah, going into that season, we spoke to him and he obviously you say Wayne Rooney left, and I think mm -hmm. Yobo was a little bit unsettled by the departure of Wayne Rooney. Was there any other like was that kind of feeling throughout the squad that it was a bit unsettled because one of the star players had left or? Just well, I mean, uh, well, I mean, me coming into the club, it, I wasn't unsettled by Wayne leaving. It was more so, I, I, it felt like I was taking his place. So I, I had to step up in a Big sense. Big shoes to fill. Um, yeah, basically. Um, I wouldn't, um, how do I put it? He was still a kid. He was still a teenager. He was still an up, up and coming player, but a great player. Uh, sorry, not great. Sorry, I'm not going to say great player just yet. He's become a great player. Um, at that point, he was uh, he was tipped for the top, basically. So he'd done really well, you know, scoring against Arsenal. His first goal, free kick, top corner. Um, and the Everton fans loved him. He's an Evertonian, a blue through and through. So um, expectations on me and the pressure on me um, was quite big. But with my background and where I'd been and my former clubs, I knew I could step up to it. Yeah, obviously when you arrived at Everton, it was, like you say, you had a couple of relegations with Ipswich and Leicester, but I think we were very much expected to be in another relegation battle given that we had struggled the previous year and of course, yes. when we left. Um, sure. That was the, the general consensus among the mainstream media and that was only hammered home on the opening day when we were beaten by Arsenal. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, so... What was the sort of moves in the dressing room? Of course, I think Wayne Rooney was still there at this stage. What was he was, he was he was go? Yeah. I, well, I don't know whether he's still there. I think he was. Um, I think he had might have just gone. But regardless, um, uh, we played the first game against Arsenal, um, and I was on the bench, and we lost for for zip, and um, it wasn't pretty. But Arsenal were on fire. I mean. 
Arsenal are Arsenal at that point, you know, the likes of Terry Henry and et cetera. Um, but we all be- went back into the changing rooms. We looked at each other. We learned a lot from that game, learned a, a, a lot from that game. I don't know whether we played one up front that game. I think we played two was, up front. I think, I think it was Kevin Campbell start, and you come off the bench, didn't you? Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, and then the second game was against... Um, Palace. Uh, Palace. And um, I think, of course, Thomas Gravison scored two goals. He's come from behind. And then uh, a certain Marcus Benk gets the third goal, first goal for Everton. How did that feel? Oh, amazing. Um, I, I would have liked the first goal to be at um, Goodison Park. But, um, again, playing for Palace, it was nice yeah, to um, score the goal there, you know. Um, uh, it, do you know what? It, it was a hard game. Palace actually dominated, to be honest, um, for the first half. Uh, it was quite scary. But we thought we were going to get beat. But going into the change rooms at half time, um, we all pulled together. Tommy being the quality player he is, Lee Carsley backing him up, uh, Kev Kilban being on the wing, um, uh, the likes of um, Stubber. Um, being at the back, um, uh, and Stubbs, I think he. I remember a moment at one nil down. I think we were at the time, and Andy Johnson runs round the goalkeeper, and Stubbs blocks right. it on the line. Saves there you go. Push. Right. So we was under the cosh. We was under the cosh. I'm not going to say we were lucky, but what we done is that we got together, we dominated it, and we showed our quality, and that's what we done throughout the season, to be honest. And it was good that I got a goal because it, it got me off to a good start. Um, especially against a former team. Um, so it got my confidence up and um, team morale. And um, I suppose the, the players that um, have formerly been at the club, me coming in, could see what I could do and see um, the quality that I have or had. Definitely. Well, of course, you got that goal and that game proved to be a bit of a turning point, obviously coming from behind to get that win. And then we went on a bit of a good run then, of course. <laughs> A month later, we talk on the note of getting your first goal for Everton. We go to Man City a month later and Tim Cale gets his first goal for Everton and then gets mm-hmm. sent off, if you remember rightly. Right. Yeah, I do, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Over his head. It, mm-hmm. A lot of people think that was a little bit petty from the referee. Do you consider that rule to be a bit petty? What's your take on the rule? Um, I mean, I mean, referee's the referee. He's going to make a decision. I mean, what can you do? If you um, stand up in the referee's face, you're going to get sent off yourself. Um, but with 10 men, we knew what we could do. Um, Timmy getting sent off was a, a big deal because he was a big part of our, our, our team. Um, but as a, uh, the formation that we had, one up front, and um, we were quite defensive that, that year. Um, not really attacking, but when we did attack, we knew what we was going to do. I think more so um, in the second half at Goodison Park, with the crowd behind us, we always knew that we'd win the game. Um, but with Timmy, yeah, and you agree, but um, with Timmy getting sent off, especially at Man City, uh, it was hard, it was nerve-wracking, but uh, we knew we were going to win the game. So, Yeah, it was, it was, it was obviously we ground out a 1-0 win and then we go and beat Middlesbrough 1-0 the week after and you get your first goal at Goodison yeah. Park. How does it feel to score in front of the Goodison crowd for the first time? I mean, um, it was. It, I'm going to say it was against Southgate. Um, he came across, tackled me, I chipped the goalkeeper um, and went celebrated. Him, it. Yeah, went in off him. It, it's, it, it's, people kind of say, it, would, it, would it have gone in? But it's my goal. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to claim it. Um, so that got, that got that away from you. No, definitely not. If anyone wants to try and take it away from me, I'm here. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that was that. That was it. It was a sunny afternoon, actually. Um, the crowd, uh, I think, we had full capacity actually, and um, the crowd got behind me, um, and they've always been behind me. Uh, hence why I still celebrate and still uh, love the Blues and still f- feel part of um, the Blues family. That's great to hear. Obviously, we were going to go on to like your sort of legacy at the club later on. Two months and. Two more well taken goals against Norwich and Aston Villa later. We're going into December, still in third place in the table. Is it at this point where you and the lads started to think a top four finish was a real possibility? 
well, you speak about Norwich, so I played for Ipswich, so scoring against Norwich was um, uh, yeah, a good, it was a good thing as well because they were booing me throughout the game, and then uh, pretty well taken goal. Yeah, Tommy, uh, I, I I pulled off the back of one of the um, defenders, and Tommy played me through, and I put it in the um, left hand corner. Um, so to celebrate against uh, uh, Norwich with Everton was um, was good. Um, and then we won, and then we went to Aston Villa um, and, and won there too. Um, but you talk about um, us thinking about winning the league or staying in the top four or top five or top ten. We didn't even, we, I don't think, if I remember, we didn't even speak about any of that. We were just playing games on games. And I think just being a, 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 becoming a, a, a team we're looking after each other on and off the pitch. Um, families and Tim, Tim and I, um, uh, Dunk, Stubber, we all used to go out together and the families and the wives would go out together. So it was a family situation and always um, took into account that we had to be together and be in the change rooms together. Definitely. That's, uh, it's great to hear that because obviously I think we go into that Merseyside derby and there's a lot of optimism and we win the game 1-0, your first Merseyside derby, a very memorable goal by Lee Carsley. You played yep. an important part in the run-up to that goal and, of course, the celebration. It's, it's yep. worth remembering, isn't it, that you were the guy who well, first mobbed him when the goal went in and it led to that Well, I, well yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, if I, if I could say, uh, coming up to the game, uh, the whole team, um, the whole club were nervous. Very nervous because we hadn't won in ten years um, against um, uh, Liverpool. Um, so this was a big occasion, and as I said, we were all together. So we, being at Goodison Park, we knew we could do something. We knew we could achieve something, and we just went at it. I mean, it. it I'm going to be honest. It, it probably wasn't pretty football, but we got a result. Um, I remember the ball coming up to me. I laid it off to Lee Carsley. He put it, uh, he drove it and um, scored. Um, and then I ran after him and, and took him down. And then you see the pile, the um, famous pile where Tim Cahill's on the top of the pile. Um, yeah. I, I've, I've still got the picture. I think every one of us, we, after the game, um, uh, the picture that was taken got brought into the change rooms and we all got the picture and we've all got it in our house today. Um, but one, I think that's what yeah. we say. Obviously, you were the one who started all that by taking him down, and we want to thank you for creating such an iconic moment for Everton. Because, like you say, you've all got the pictures, and it's symbolic. I think that moment of the successes we had that season. You haven't got to thank me, buddy. I thank you um, for the occasion, and 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 you all being behind us. Um, but one thing I take out of that picture is that if you look on the bottom bottom of the uh, the pile. You can see my boots hanging out the bottom, and I was saying, I was saying to him, "Get off me! I can't breathe. Get off me! I can't breathe." Um, but um, yeah, no, iconic, and um, it was amazing to be a part of it. To be honest, like I say, it was a, it was a symbol of the success and what that game meant to us. How, mm -hmm. how, how does it feel for you to get to play in the derby and end up on the winning side at your first attempt? I'll be honest with you. Um, I didn't. I think uh, I thought that I thought the derby would be a little bit more, uh, and excuse me uh, the way I'm going to say it, but a bit more aggressive with uh, Liverpool and Everton fans. I, I don't mean I, I wanted the fans to fight or, or you know, be on the streets and you know, smashing glasses or or, or being aggressive towards each other. But I, I kind of I, I, I found it a bit confusing that Liverpool fans and Everton fans would sit together in the stadium. Um, and cheer on their team, um, but again, being part of, a part of it and a, a part of our win after so many years, and being where we were in the table and winning that game was amazing. Yeah, I think it's funny you should mention obviously the fans sitting together. It's not quite as common these days, but no, it still happens on occasions, and it's strange like that because Liverpool as a city is very unique. A lot of families are mixed in terms of sure, sure. Yeah. There's the, we, I have Liverpool fans in my family. There's mm -hmm. a lot of fans as well. It's very mixed. It's and that's the way Liverpool is. It regardless of yeah. football, it's a it's a family thing. 
well there you go you just said the family thing and that's why I, I, I always go back to the blues I always go back to Goodison Park or that's that's always my side because it's a family thing it's not just an aggressive thing it, you know it's a it's a support system and people support your team reds or blues but there's respect there and once there's respect there that's what I'm tapped into that's what I like and that's why I, I love playing for Everton. There, there really was and there, there was a really good team spirit I think after that derby Lee Carsley himself actually said that in his interview and a lot of people said that sort of spirit was the key to our success that season with the mm. likes of Carsley, Gravison, Mikel Arteta, Cahill, Kevin Campbell and of course Duncan Ferguson there was so many big characters throughout the whole team and what was that like in the dressing room and to get to trade? I mean, I mean, I mean, what you didn't say there is the likes of Kevin Campbell and Duncan and um, uh, uh, various other players, they didn't really get playing time because I was playing up front. Um, but what, the pro- there wasn't a problem. Like, regardless who was playing, we patted each other on the back and wished them luck and were, were confident and grateful for each other. Um, so there was no uh, jealousy or, or or anyone. No bad blood. No bad blood at all. It was just a team game, and the squad wasn't massive. Arteta came in. Arteta came in um, probably. Yeah, I think it was what four or five games into the season. Uh, he came from what Rangers. I think he came from, and he wasn't the the tested article or the tested result, but um, he came in and. Um, was a technically gifted player, but just made his name at Everton um, and became, a, a, and, and still is, a legend at Everton. Uh, a very, a good very player, player. player. Yeah, great player on and off the pitch. Um, um, and he just literally just slotted himself in within the side. We can't mention him without mentioning, of course, Tim Cahill, who joined the same summer as you. Uh, how does it feel playing alongside him? Of course, he was probably the player who played closest to you in that sort of attack when you were playing as the lone striker. And how does it feel well, to have him supporting you? Well, Timmy and I, as 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 we've just spoke about, Timmy and I came in fresh blood, um, expectations. Uh, Timmy came from Millwall. Um, no one knew what Timmy could do realistically. No one knew what I could do realistically, but being within the family club, the Blues, and the uh, the, the likes of Duncan, Kevin Campbell, and and uh, 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 Stubber, um, uh, Gravison, we learned from them and we grew, um, and that's why Timmy grew and as and continues to grow. I mean, I speak to Timmy now and then, um, and he's still doing what he's doing. He's coaching. He's He's got a good life, but the Evertonians love him. And once I left, Timmy moved on. He, he stepped up and he, he became one of the world's best for Australia, World Cup. He scored some great goals. Overhead kick against, um, I think it was Arsenal. Was it Arsenal? Uh, what, he scored one against Chelsea, I think. Oh, I think it was Chelsea. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, Timmy, um, yeah. I mean, I, I ran and I, I worked um, playing one up front. It was hard work. Um, I wish I had a, a partner to work with me. I probably would have scored more goals. Hopefully, I'd have scored more goals. But I'm glad that that season, I contributed in a sense where we uh, got in the top um, five. Yeah, well, it, you didn't necessarily score a lot of goals, but the effort and the work rate that you put in really endeared yourself to the Everton faithful. I think they really love you for that, and they still do. It's, that's kind of the legacy that you left at Everton was like, that kind of striker who really puts the hard yards in and it reaped rewards for the team? I think it, it frustrates me. I'm going to be honest with you. It frustrates me because I know I could have scored more goals. It was just, we, we were probably the first team that year that played one up front. Um, so I took it upon myself, or sorry, not took it upon myself, but um, it was for the team. Um, so I had to run, I had to work, I had to create um, chances for Tim, for other players. Um, I didn't really get many chances myself, um, but when I did get chances, I, I, I put them away. Um, so I, w- I would have liked to have a, a, a couple of seasons to maybe work with James Beattie and 
that maybe have two up front and maybe um, show the, the Blues or the Evertonians or maybe myself um, in my head that I, I could have done uh, or scored a lot more goals for the Blues. Nonetheless, it didn't seem to tarnish your reputation, what you left behind at Everton because the fans are still very fond of you. Sure. And obviously, moving forward, there was a... Like, you linked up really well, I thought, with Thomas Gravison, we mentioned before. I thought he linked up brilliantly with you. I think he set a lot of your goals up, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He did. Um, all, uh, Tommy Gravison is one of the, the big players in this world. He, he's so technically gifted. Um, when I first met Tommy, um, I'm going to be honest with you, we didn't really get off to a good start. Um, um, but then once we got on the pitch, I think um, uh, I think the goal at uh, Norwich will, will show you where we kind of touch base. Or even Crystal Palace. I, all I had to do is look in his eyes and um, I'd make a run and it just put me through. So it's kind of like telepathic in a sense. Yeah, I we, wouldn't even... We saw that yeah. a lot in the first half of that season. And I think... Mm. He set a few more goals up for you as well before yep. he left. And obviously, we're going to move on to that now. Was when, when he left in January 2005, he went to Real Madrid. And it was a move that seemed to come out of nowhere. He certainly left mm-hmm. us worse off when he left. I sure. thought it a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... um, the the, the rumour was they wanted Lee Carsley. <laughs> but they couldn't... The rumour was they wanted Lee Carsley, but they couldn't tell the difference out of Tommy or Lee Carsley. But... Um... Yeah, Tommy um, went to Real Madrid. Um, I love the guy. Absolutely top player. Um, he went to play with some good um, internationals and um, worldwide players. Um, Played alongside so, Zidane in the midfield, you can't. Yeah, there you go. That's a dream. That's what you do as a, a kid. You want to play alongside those sort of players. Um, I'm not saying that you don't want to be at Everton, but who doesn't want to go to Real Madrid, the likes of you know Barcelona? and play alongside those players. So, um, hat, hat off to him. Um, he was a grafter. He ran hard. He worked hard. He talked hard. Um, he's got a great personality on and off the pitch. Uh, very fiery. Um, but someone that I um, respect um, in dearly. That's right. And, of course... You say like uh, he's a fiery character. There was, there was a lot of big characters in that dressing room. Have you got any interesting stories you could share with us from the dressing room from behind the scenes, maybe? I probably couldn't tell you that right now, son. Ah, fair enough, mate. Not so <laughs> but they were, they, but they were, they weren't, they were, they're not fiery stories that, that we turned on each other or anything like that. We no, I wasn't expecting them to be, but I can imagine yeah, there's no, some definitely. interesting things going on. Yeah, definitely. But obviously, moving forward, we. We travelled to Southampton in the midst of a pretty poor run of form and we have to talk about that game. We scored early, we go 2-1 down, we're trailing yeah. into at a time. It didn't seem like it was going to be our day at all and then yeah. you pop up with that goal, leather it in off the bar and create some absolute mm-hmm. scenes in the away end. How, do you remember, how well do you remember that Southampton game? Um, I mean, I'm 42 now, I'm 43 this year, so I, I, not too well, but I remember it, don't worry about that. Um, I'm going to start with, at that point, we brought James Beat in and um, uh, Moisey st- uh, uh, chose James before me. So I was frustrated. I was angry. Um, and I was on the bench at, uh, at that point. Um, I remember coming off the bench, the um, uh, ball getting kicked up to me. I, um, uh, I laid it off the dunk. dunk. I was shouting at Dunk to lay me in. Uh, he laid me in. I took it quite wide, actually. Um, but at that point, I was quite angry. So it was an angry goal. So I took it quite right. It felt it, it the wide. way you whacked it in off the bar. Yeah, so I, I, that, didn't you? Let, I let it go. And um, it ended up in the top corner. And uh, as you see, the celebration was quite stiff, quite um, abrupt. And the boys jumped on me. And um, I remember um, sending Harry down that, that year. Um, I speak to Jamie Redknapp quite 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 a lot. He lives down the road from me, <coughs> and he said to me, "You sent us down that year," um, but we smile about it. Um, but that's probably one of the um, best goals that I've scored. Um, 
on the for the occasion and uh, obviously for the Blues. Especially like like I say, I think it was I love goals that are powered in off the bar like that. So that one, obviously, I remember yeah. that one really fondly. It was a great goal. I mean, the angle was tight. Um, to be honest with you, if you asked anyone or any footballer or me to do it again, it probably wouldn't happen four times out of ten. But um, it happened that day, so I'm grateful for that. They quite literally smashed it. But even after that game, our form was still quite stuttery towards the end of that season. Sure. People yes, it was. Yeah. People started to believe that Liverpool would catch us in the race for fourth and. Yeah, there's five games left to play. We face a midweek game against Man United. You, yeah, you played on the right wing that day with Duncan Ferguson as the yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And he scored a crucial goal, didn't he? We win one nil and we pull back ahead in that race. What were your memories of that night under the lights of Goodison? The atmosphere was unreal, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we knew we had to win again. You know, again, a force like Man United and the players that they had. Um, but we knew we had to win. I think the chairman came in. Uh, I think it was that night and he said um, if you win the next four games he's going to take us on holiday um, so that was another inspiration for us um, not that we needed it we knew what we needed to do and we needed we needed to get form back um, but Duncan scoring that goal and us winning against Man United just it, it brought it back yeah obviously I think the atmosphere of that game was it's one oh, of the huge fans. massive Massive, every yeah. every Everton fan recalls it as one of the best atmospheres they've recalled. Of course, oh, saying huge. something. I mean, the, they, you, I, I get again. It, it's not cliche, but it, 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 the twelfth man, you know, it helps, and the whole stadium of roaring. You could hear the 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 seats going up and down, people stumping, clapping, shouting. It was amazing. Yeah, it must be great to be able to play a part in a game like that, and of course. We get over the line, we get that win. And a few weeks later, we beat Newcastle 2-0 at Goodison to all but seal yeah. fourth place. What was that Newcastle game like going into it? Do you remember much of it? Obviously, the, you had a few incentives, like you say, to go into that game. And I mean, nerve-wracking. I mean, uh, uh, you, you said to me earlier on, did we know we were going to... Um, or did, did we want to get, you know, in the top five or fourth place at the start of the season? No, we didn't. But we knew at that point we've got a chance and we're not, we're not going to let it go. We've worked too hard for this. Um, so playing against Newcastle, we knew we had to win and getting a result was amazing. Again, like obviously we seal that result, but of course our place in the top four wasn't confirmed until the next day when Liverpool lost 3-1 at Arsenal. That's the one, That's the one yeah. Yeah, um, we it was a live game on the TV on a Sunday afternoon. Were you watching that game? I think I was. I, I can't remember that far back. I can't remember. But I think we all um, were watching it. Um, and once uh, the result came in, we all celebrated. Uh, and celebrated in a good, um, a good stance, a good um, way. Uh, we all went, went out for dinner and um, had a couple of drinks. Let's just say that. Yeah, I can imagine so. I mean, the it's not every day that you achieve something like that, especially against the odds the way we did. And I can imagine the the feeling was like, what was it like to be finally like you all sat down together and you sort of realised that you had done it. Um, I think we all knew, or, or we all knew what we could do. We all knew off the back of the season before that we could achieve something. But achieving uh, beating Liverpool after 10 years or um, becoming, getting fourth place um, was, wasn't beyond us, but it was um, an achievement that we all wanted in our career. Um, so it was a long season, you know, rain, snow, fun, but well, not fun, but, um, you know, night games, uh, losing against Arsenal first game of the season. And then coming to this abrupt, well, not abrupt, but uh, 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 the fourth place where Liverpool had lost, which, I mean, it was 50-50 whether Liverpool would lose against Arsenal. Um, and they lost quite heavily. Um, just showed us that the hard work that we put in throughout the season um, meant something. So, again, um, my teammates, 
and the Evertonians will always be in my heart because we worked so hard throughout the season to maintain our, our confidence and don't get me wrong, confidence was down at times and but we all picked each other up and worked with each other and um, hence why they're all my family now. That's brilliant to hear and of course you spoke about the chairman coming in and giving you the incentive of the holiday. After the season finished, you all went to Marbella to celebrate, am I right? Yeah, we did, yeah. Yeah, there's any any interesting stories from that one? Again, I can't tell you that. What's it what's the, what's in Vegas stays in Vegas, buddy. Uh, <laughs> it's a shame the same has to go for Marbella, I suppose. So yeah, there you go, there you go. Uh, but of course, at the end of that season, you've made more appearances than anybody in the whole season. You made 43 appearances. David Moyes was obviously really impressed with you that season. How was he to work with? And do you have a good relationship with David Moyes? <laughs> I'm grateful for Moyes to bring me to the Blues and into Everton. I, I, I have respect for him for that. Um, but um, towards the... Um, I'd say that, sorry, the start of the next season, um, I lost um, confidence within him and respect for him, uh, the way he um, treated me and um, cast me out. Um, and that's me being honest with you. And that's me being honest with you. Yeah. Well, obviously, we move forward to the following season. And before all that, spirits were very high going into the season and a few new signings came in. Uh, Phil Neville was probably the most experienced player to arrive and he became the club captain two years later. What did he bring to the dressing room? Uh, Phil coming in was good. Um, he was an experienced player coming from Man United. Um, uh, I wouldn't say he was getting on, but you know he, was, he wasn't he um, was a youngster at that point. Um, but his, fresh, uh, sorry, his experience, um, I mean, he spoke to me a couple of times. Um, he was always uh, talking to Moisey. Um, um, and he 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 brought a, a freshness, a, not a freshness to the team, but he brought brought a, a, another quality to the side, which Everton needed. I'm not saying that the players that we had weren't quality, but you know we, Everton have got to attract good players, um, experienced players, and players that are in England that know what Everton are about. And um, Phil coming into the side. He just grasped that straight away. He also so, knew um, what it took to win titles as well, which basic, is probably the next basic. level. There you go. So it was good for him to come in. Um, so it was good to have him around the change rooms and around the club, yeah. Of course, just after he arrives, we go into the season with the Champions League qualifier. We were drawn against Villarreal. We were a very tough team. We lose the first leg 2-1 mm -hmm. at Goodison, and then we have to win against them in Spain. The second yeah. leg was incredibly controversial, wasn't it? We were knocked out after Dunk's goal was disallowed by Pierluigi Colina, who was supposedly the best referee in world football. But how right. did you feel about that decision? Well, um, honestly, <clears throat> it got disallowed because um, I got called offside. Um, I was Is that at the what back it was? Post. Yeah, I got called offside. Um, so Dunk was in the middle of the goal, put it just by me on the back post. I was called offside, but. I wasn't offside. How could um, he be a corner, wasn't it? Say what? Mikel Arteta took a corner. It was a, it was a corner. Yeah, he took a corner. And Dunk put it in and I was on the uh, back post and there was a, a player on the back post with me. Um, as Dunk put it in, the player ran out and the referee called it offside. Um, hence why we were all outraged and um, upset. So... Obviously, it was infuriating. I think it, it still angers our fans to this very day yep. that that goal yep. was disallowed. And what was the yep. overall feeling from the players, the playing squad, after working so hard, like you say, the previous year, pulling together to get into the top four? Oh, gutted. Absolutely sport. gutted. Absolutely gutted. I think we spent about four days out there before um, the game, uh, uh, trained at the stadium. Uh, we were confident. Um, but again, being, playing in Europe, they, I'm not saying they've got different rules, but um, the, the way they would mark or the way they would play, um, we, uh, we didn't feel it was going our way throughout the game. And to get that goal at the end of it get, gave us hope. And then when the referee um, disallowed it, we kind of just knew it wasn't our day. Um, you know, we went home with our heads um, down and... Um, but we know that there, 
there'll be another opportunity and, and we need to step ourselves up, get ourselves together and um, work together to maybe get ourselves back into it. Of course, like it was, it's just a very sickening feeling to, of course, work so hard and have it. It was effectively stolen from us because there was absolutely nothing wrong with that goal. You did nothing mm-hmm. wrong. You were offside. What? What? Well, I think if you look back at it, I was definitely not offside. Um, for about a week, I wouldn't say I blame myself, but I, I should not. I quit. No, I, I don't blame myself. I just questioned for like myself. Um, was it me? Did I do something wrong? But I watched it over and over again. And if you want to watch it yourself, or ever, ever, I've, ever I've watched over. it too many times, and <laughs> it's pretty drama. I promise you now, like there was nothing wrong with that goal. It was, it was so controversial. But um, again, without VR, you can't, you can't look back on it, and you can't turn it round. So we had to get on with it. We had to pick ourselves up and um, suppress it and move forward. Obviously, we tried to move forward, but uh, the league campaign that followed got off to a disastrous start. We lost seven out of eight games. We were bottom of the league at the end of October. We were also knocked out of Europe, the UEFA Cup. Mm-hmm. It was a yep. shameful 5-1 thumping by Dinamo Bucharest. What, what mm-hmm. went so wrong at the start of that following season? Um, I mean, uh, being away from the club, I couldn't really tell you. I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd be... Um... I'd be disrespectful to um, certain players and managers and coaches if I if I commentated on that. But um, what I'd say to you is, like when I came into the clubs, you had the likes of Dunk, you had the likes of Kevin Campbell, Kev Kilban, Carsley, Tom Graveson, who were at the club for a long while. Hibbert, um, who could um, show the players or the new foreign players or whoever came into the club or the, the youngsters coming through, and teach them the way of uh, the Evertonians and the family way we play and how we go about business. Um, so I don't know whether that was part of it. I don't know whether it's been part of it for the last couple of years. But I know what I will say is that you need the likes of Dunkerson, Dunk there, um, Alan Stubbs, um, just to show the, the, the kids, the, the, the players that come into um, Goodison Park. Um, how how we play and how we go about the stuff. You can hear by the way you speak, you clearly have a lot of respect for Duncan Ferguson. He's, how do you feel about him being the assistant coach now? Oh, he's my man. I love him to bits. I love him to bits. Um, he's blue to him? I, I, I went to uh, the training ground last year um, for Everton TV. Um, and spoke to him briefly. Um, I don't speak to him um, uh, all the time, but when I do, we have a good chat. Um, he is um, he is someone that's come through the time, scored goals. You know, he's had a, a great career. He's you know he's been in prison. And he's had ups and downs. Um, but one thing he is, he's a good man off the pitch, on the pitch, definitely. Um, and he cares about. Um, people's well, well-being and uh, their mental health and stuff. So it's not just about being a player and a coach. It's, it, it's, it's, it's more than that for him. Well, um, that, that, he's definitely nailed his, nailed his cause to the post, if you know what I mean, because mm-hmm. during this time of lockdown, of course, he's been doing all kinds of brilliant things to help out the Everton family. Like you say, he, he really buys into that ethos That's that you right. keep talking about, the family ethos. Mm-hmm. And it was great to it's great to see that that was obviously running through the squad. Uh, obviously, this second season was a bit of a struggle, um, and we started to see less and less of you as you were restricted to cameo appearances off the bench. You spoke about like how that started to hurt you a little bit. James Beattie was mm-hmm. often picked over you mm-hmm. in the starting eleven. You were clearly yep. must have been frustrated by your lack of game time in that second season. Mm-hmm. Oh, massively <laughs> angered. Um, I mean, I worked so hard the first season to get myself a place in the team. And then um, David um, Moyes brings in J- B- James Beattie, who I loved, by the way. Um, great player. Um, didn't do so well at Goodison Park um, at the Blues. Um, but again, I think David tried to bring in James and play one up front, and uh, James wasn't wasn't accustomed to that. He's a two up front. Yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't accustomed to that. 
he's got a great finish, a great free kick, free kick, great right foot, uh, good friend of mine. Good, good friend of mine. I think he's, um, he should have given you and him more of a chance to play together up top. I wish he did. I wish he did. Um, I still talk about it and think about it till this day. And speaking about it with you, I wish he did. Um, again, like we spoke about earlier on in the conversation, I, I, I worked so hard, one up front, to uh, get my place and be in the team and become one of the team, one of the 11. Um, and then um, coming back the second season, kind of being cast out, that's how I felt. Um, and brushed aside was kind of disrespectful towards me. Um, hence why I won't speak about David because um, uh, my confidence dropped and um, my um, lack of respect dropped towards David too. Um, but that, that's here or there. Um, oh, and that's in the past. So, it was yeah. disappointing for us because we, we know you put such, such a shift in and the chips were very much down. And we definitely, I definitely thought that you could have had more of a part to play and help him pull us up out of that sort of dark period we were in. But instead, it was January comes around and you end up moving on to Charlton Athletic for yep. around just over two million. Yeah. How did that move end up coming about? Did you end up hearing off Alan Kerbishley or? No, I actually went in for a transfer. I actually went in That's to. Yeah, I answered a transfer. Um, it, uh, it just became too much. Um, I, I couldn't sit on the bench. I couldn't watch the boys playing and me not being a part of it. And uh, I lost respect for um, David Moyes and um, the way he was treating me. Um, it wasn't the Evertonians or it wasn't the club. I just I, I wasn't happy. I just had a baby. My wife was... Uh, sorry, my girlfriend um, was in Manchester and... Um, it was frustrating. I, I, I became angry. Um, um, so I needed to get back to London and um, be with my family and people around me who could help me get back to where I, I, I wanted to get back to. And of course, obviously, the, the move comes in from Charlton Athletic, Alan Kerbishley. You go down there, I think you scored mm -hmm. on your first game for them, didn't you? I, yeah, I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, you played alongside your namesake, Darren Bent. And you finally got, <laughs> yeah. finally got that opportunity to play in a two up top. And it seemed to work quite well with you two. Um, I, it, didn't, it didn't work well at Charlton. I mean, it was nice to be back in London. It was nice to, um, it was good to go to a, a club where he was playing two up front. And good to see Darren. And I mean, Darren and I, Darren came through the together, yeah. at Ipswich, yeah. Um, I remember playing, he, him playing his first game at Liverpool. And um, and uh, he came on and we played up front together. So that was the first time we played up front together. Um, but then uh, going back, sorry, go back to London and then playing alongside him uh, was good. It, um, I'm not gonna say a dream come true, but it is nice to play along. You know, someone that, that you've um, watched come up and go through the ranks. And um, he went on to go for I think it was twenty or thirty million that season, which was a record. Went to Spurs, didn't he? Yeah, so of course, Charlton got relegated at the end of your second season there and yeah. you move on to Wigan, uh, who are your final team in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you go on to play for a few more clubs in the Championship, but before we finish, I just want to ask you about your move to Indonesia later in your career. It's not a career move that many players have made. What was behind mm -hmm. that decision? Um, so literally... Uh, going from Wigan, I went to Birmingham, um, and um, I, I will say, just on the record, um, that leaving Everton, um, I kind of lost a bit of passion for football, and um, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't work hard or didn't love the game. It just, I, I just couldn't get that that bite back. Um, so at Birmingham, I went on a couple of loans, and um, I think my last loan was at QPR. Um, didn't quite work out and I, at that point I was I think I was 31 32 and I was just thinking do you know what why not just go on holiday just get away um, and then um, Indonesia Asia came in Michikuku um, so I thought it'd be a good journey a, a good experience um, 
I'm going to be honest, it was a good payday. They treated me like royalty. Um, but now being uh, a, a foreigner in a different country, I appreciate foreigners coming to England, you know, when they don't settle and don't actually do well or the food's not right, the language and et cetera, et cetera. But um, I was supposed to be there for uh, two years, but I was only there for eight months. And um, I decided I'd, uh, I had to come home. Um, I missed my daughter, um, my girlfriend at the time. Um, my family, my friends. Um, so um, it was short lived, but it was an experience. Um, um, and I'm glad that I went out because um, I wouldn't know what I know now. So experience is a, is a journey, and I made that journey. So my life's been good. It's been frustrating, <laughs> but I'm, I've had a good career. And um, without football, I probably wouldn't be the person I am today. Certainly, of course, that's what we're going to finish with now. We're going to look back on your Everton legacy. You didn't, like you see before, you didn't actually score that many goals, but Everton fans loved that sort of work rate and sort of, of course, the passion you showed. I think that, that first season you had with us was, obviously, it's one that's remembered very fondly and I think you're remembered very fondly for your work rate and mm-hmm. what you brought to that team and the impact that you made in that first season. How does it feel to be remembered in that way by the Everton faithful? It's amazing to be remembered by the by the Blues, by the Evertonians. Um, um, every time I come up north and um, uh, and see the Evertonians, they they hug me and they they, they give me a great embrace. In my mind, um, I could have given more or gave more. Um, so it's frustrating in that sense, but. Um, it, it's nice to be appreciated and um, loved in that sense um, that I gave something to um, the fans and uh, the club um, full spot um, and um, achieving something that, uh, you know, Liverpool for the first time in a while. Um, so it was good to be a part of that. But again, frustrating not to uh, be given that chance to actually show what I could have done. It might sound a little bit selfish from me, but um, it will play on my mind and it, it, it will frustrate me. But again, like you say, it's nice to come back up north and um, be embraced by my family, my blues, the the team that I always talk about, always watch and I'm very passionate about. Well, so we were just going to finish with some quick questions. And one of those was, do you still keep an eye on Everton, how they're doing? And it looks like that's a pretty much answers itself, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I I done um uh, 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 I commentated the other well not the other day but a couple of months ago against uh, Chelsea Everton, um, and we lost. Um, Ever Blues didn't turn up. I was so I'm not going to say angry, but I was so frustrated. That was a terrible game. I know which one. Oh, was terrible, most. terrible. Even the manager didn't know what to say. It was so terrible. I don't like to um. Uh, put anyone down or put the players down but um, the players didn't turn up that day the team didn't turn up that day Um, but I'm glad that I mean a couple of weeks or a a month or so before that we were in nearly in a uh, bottom three Um, so we've done well to get ourselves out of that situation and hopefully with this coronavirus and um, everything going on and the season coming back up we can um, maintain our, our, our status and and go on, um, maybe make a few signings. We've got a, a great academy, young players coming through. Again, with Dunk being in there, um, helping those players on. I just hope and I wish that um, there's a few more um, experienced players alongside them to help them get through this transition. Well, that's the aim, I think, to sort of grow as a club and bring in those calibre of players. Of course, we brought in a very high-calibre manager in Carlo Ancelotti. What's your take on having him in charge at Everton? Awesome. Absolutely awesome. I mean, he's done it. He's been there. Um, every big club you can think of. Um, I think he just needs time. Uh, he needs to get his own team. Um, I know fans at times get frustrated, but um, give him a little bit of time. We don't need manager coming in, managers coming in and out. Just give him a little bit of time, and I think he'll. Um, I think he'll get stuff back on the right track. 
I'm very confident myself in that, so it's great to hear you agree with yeah. me on that. Yeah, and of course, we were talking about like a few former players, Duncan Ferguson. Do you still speak to any former players? Like, do you keep in touch with a lot of players? Um, Kev Kilban's a good friend of mine. Uh, Carsley, Tim, I speak to uh, quite quite often. Uh, most of them, most of them, most of them. Yeah, I mean, like you say, it was a very close knit group, so it doesn't surprise me that a lot of you were all still in such. It was such a fantastic mm. season and. You shared those memories together, of course. What was your best memory of your time at Everton? My best memory? Oh, um, I've got lots. Um, oh, um, I think um, best memory, which was a, a frustrating memory, is scoring at Southampton. Uh, the night against Man United, which, as we spoke about, uh, the roar and the, the the passion about the club, um, and then the first time uh, probably Dunk said hello to me. <laughs> You're probably going to ask, well, "What do you mean by that?" And Dunk didn't speak to me for two weeks um, when I oh, joined really? the club. Yeah, he didn't speak to me for two weeks. Well, no, he spoke to me, but it was kind of blasé. Um, I asked um, uh, McFadden. Why does Dunk not speak? Why, why is he not speaking to me? He said he's trying to work you out. So <laughs> once I... Him. There you go. So once I um, realised um, what he was doing, he basically was seeing if I was part of the team, if I was about the team, and if I'm good enough for the team. And once um, we worked that out, and he, 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 I suppose, was confident within me, we became good friends. So I respect That's him for that. That's the Duncan Ferguson we know and love, isn't it? There you go. That's the one. And uh, just two more questions. First one, best players you played with, if you could pick like a five-a-side team of the players you played alongside and you spell at Everton, what team would you go with? That's at Everton? Question. Yeah, that's a tough question, isn't it? At Everton. All right, okay. Um, all right. Uh, do, do, do. Without me in it? Uh, yeah, without you in it. But let's get without five me. names. Okay. Well, I'll go with um, Tommy. No, you'd say him. Tim. Mikel. Uh, Tom, Tim, Tim. So that's three. Um, I'll go with um, Weir. David. So that's four. And then I will go with Hibbert. Good one. Mm. Hibbert was... Um, out of interest, we're going in goal. Going in goal? Oh, we know who's going in goal. Well, there's a, there was only really one who we can... Come on, we know who's going in goal. I mean, right... What a, what a goal. Richard, Richard's, a, Richard's a good friend of mine, but yeah, you know who's going in goal. Yeah, he was fantastic for us that season. Yeah, oh, awesome, awesome. Absolutely. Nigel, absolutely brilliant. Criminally underrated uh, goalkeeper. Oh, amazing. Shot stopper. Um, he'd probably kick me in the face for it. Not so good um, coming out for the, the, you know, the catches and stuff when there's a corner. But shot stopping, goal kicks, and, and a great man off and off the pitch. Off and on the pitch, sorry. Um, and a mature face, an experienced face within the change rooms. Like I said, um, that's what we had at Everton. So yeah, definitely Nigel, definitely in goal. And of course, I think that seems to be the like sort of recurring theme of this interview is like we talk about this team. It always seems to be remembered as a team full of great characters. Mm -hmm. So it, well, more, yeah, great characters, experienced characters, um, but um, played international football throughout their careers as well, which helps the likes of me and um, Timmy Arteta. You know, young players, or even um, Osman, Osman coming through. Leon, um, he was a, a great um, academy player, came through, didn't play the first season, but then went on to be, and play for England too. So um, having them players around you helps you to get to where you need to get um, with these experienced players around you. It was the right combination, really, of the talent and the application, really, which sort of kicked us on to that success that season, wasn't it? 
Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, I, I, I don't think you could um, replica that or shadow that again because those players are not going to be there for a good while um, unless, you know, um, there's a couple of players there for a certain amount of, of time. But in this day and age, I don't think it's going to work like that. Players so, do um, come and go far too often. I yeah, they, I think they do, you know, in this day and age. So I don't think it's going to replica that or, or shadow that. But um, there's, there's definitely good days or good years or good times coming for Blues because of, you know, the, the, the new, the new um, training ground and new stadium hopefully coming. Um, Definitely. So, yeah. So, hopefully there's good times and we can um, all sit up and cheer and go and watch them in the stands, I suppose. That leads us nicely on to the last question. Do you have a final message that you want to say to the Everton fans watching about your time at the club? I've not got a message. All I say to you is I love you all. And thank you for um, supporting me. Thank you for being behind me. And um, hopefully I'll see you all soon. Brilliant stuff, mate. And that, of course, brings us to a close. Only one and a half seasons with Everton, yet so many great memories. Testament, really, to the impact that Marcus Bent made at our club in such a short space of time, especially in a season which has proved simply unforgettable for a generation of Blues. It's been brilliant to relive these memories with you, Marcus. It's, we've been thrilled to have you on and run through them. It hopefully we'll see it again here on the Toffee Blues. You always see me again, son. I'm always here. I never die. Don't worry about that, kid. It's right. And, of course, we'll definitely see you back at Goodison Park sometime soon, no doubt. Um, I'm supposed to be, I was supposed to be coming down, um, uh, in, well, a, a month ago. But, obviously, with this going on, uh, I can't get down. So, I'll be there soon. As soon as this is all over, I'll see you soon. Fantastic. So, we'll, we'll definitely see you again at Goodison, that's for sure. So this is the end of our show, as always, to our viewers. Get involved and let us know your memories of Marcus Bent as an Everton player and um, that amazing season as a whole, too. If, of course, if you enjoyed the show, give the vid a like. And if you want to see more great Everton content, subscribe to the Toffee Blues YouTube channel and give us a follow on Twitter at Everton Newsfeed. All that's left for me to say is thank you so much, Marcus Bent, for joining me on this show today. Thank you very much, buddy. Thank you for having me, by the way. Of course, the pleasure's mine, mate. And of course, thank you guys for watching on the Toffee Blues.